Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. As you can probably see from um, what's on screen, we're going to be playing some more of the 1986 game Portal today. Um, not, as you may, you may have thought, the more, the uh, the more famous and uh, and probably more influential uh, game called Portal. I couldn't find a, um, a a category just for this version of Portal on um, on Twitch, which is a shame. I'm using the the general retro um, retro tag for for this one. It would have been nice if the um, the game had its own uh, category, but I can't find it anywhere. There's um, obviously the first one that comes up is Valve's Portal, um, and then after that, lots of other things that do have Portal in their title. But get further and further away from just being called Portal. Um, but never mind, that's a small consideration. I hope you're all well. Let's say hello to whoever's in chat today. Ah, we've got Soy Club Irville. I think I worked out how to say it. Um, returning from last time. In, in fact, if I'm correct, I think you might have been camped out in chat uh, all week, which is interesting. Um, very impressive if you're a human. Um, but perhaps a little less in, impressive if you're if you're a bot, but um, you, you're welcome. Um, I hope you enjoyed this stream. So uh, everything is looking good on the technical side of things. Let me know how we get on with the um, the sound levels. Whether the video looks good. At the moment, you're just seeing a static image of the box art for Portal, which um, every time I come back to look at it is um, it's quite striking. It's not perhaps not how I would uh, design the box art for it. I mean, it's quite uh, focused on the the typography, which is probably appropriate for something called a computer novel. Um, but there's some interesting touches. The, um, the slightly sinister faces at the the base of the image are interesting, um, and I like I like that kind of just sort of horizon, yeah, weird horizon um, on a tangent to the. The shape of the Earth as well is is interesting. And the fact they've incorporated the future year into the um, the top bar of the T that's pretty interesting too. Okay, well I think we're all we're all good, aren't we? I think our background music has ex expired, so I'm gonna drop the volume levels to an appropriate one for the game we're about to play. I think somewhere about there is good, and let's get going. Um, anybody in chat who would like to uh, say hello, please do. Um, it's always lovely to hear from people um, and share share thoughts on the game. Hopefully, right. So that's getting it's getting whirring in the background. Oh, that's I didn't mean to click on that, but there you go. Here's the here's the map of the world, the future world that we're visiting. Um, we can have a look at that for a minute while everything else loads up. Let me try this, this, this. Yes, great, that worked. Yeah, so it's um, yeah, been uh, geopolitically reorganised, I would say. So let's find our. Oh, you can hear it now. Hopefully, that's um, not too loud in competition with my voice. I did find that from last stream, I probably got the levels a little wrong. That's comfortable for my ears. Let me know how it is for you. And let me show you what's going on. Okay, here we are. So welcome back to Portal. So this is the 1986 um, uh, game that badges itself as a computer novel. And this is the um, original Amiga version we're playing. It was um, written by Rob Swigert, who is a novelist, poet, um, futurist. Um, and it's been an interesting experience so far. We've played for two two sessions, um, and I think it's living up to the the badge of being a uh, a computer novel because um, it's very much it's not really it's not really an interactive experience. I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to call it interactive fiction even. Um, it is it's kind of directed fiction, but it's using the um, the metatextual layer of uh, being accessed through this future computer system um, to enhance its storytelling. 
um, to break down the narrative in interesting ways into kind of statistical elements um, that you might not have in a straightforward um, uh, a novel, like a, like a print novel, uh, it would have been at the time. Let's load our game. So, fun fact from uh, last episode, well, last episode, last uh, stream we had of this, um, I may have forgotten to uh, to save the game after we said goodbye last time. Uh, so I did have to, I um, I played back the VOD at triple speed and um, followed followed my own actions again in sequence. So we're, we're back where we left off, I hope. That should come in in a minute. I think it takes a little while to load first time around. And um, yeah, so we just read up on some history and we have at least one new um, person to read up on. So I think that would be, can't remember their name, so it's um, Peter DeVore, who seems to be kind of the central, I don't know, protagonist or antagonist in this story? I don't know if we count as a protagonist. Um, we're kind of more the recipient of, um, like being the recipient of an epistolary uh, novel. Um, you're not necessarily involved in the story, but you're kind of part of the the, um, the super text of it, really. Um, okay, so let's remind ourselves. I think there was something like a store was um, was the grandparent. So, the last uh, the last thing we did was unlock uh, the history um, entry on the unisex movement, which proved to be kind of like a um, a social movement toward elective surgery that enabled people to have uh, various sexual organs. Um, available at will um, and that uh, I think was not viewed well at the time and subsequently was not was kind of socially taboo as well um, but that doesn't particularly seem to um, uh, reference any kind of gender identity in fact the um, the people who became unisex um, apparently were mandatorily um, given the pronoun it uh, which is interesting, and there are kind of more disturbing details about the the shape of the world in the history twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty nine section that we read. Um, it does seem to be a rather, a, um, what well, my inference is that it's kind of a rather sinister takeover of most of the world structures by uh, a giant corporation, um, and rolling into that some kind of kind of sinisterly euphemistic um, peacekeeping force. Um, which seems to be kind of an omess, uh, oppressive military, uh, well, I, I don't know if it's a dictatorship or not. Um, I guess we might find out more as we go. Um, but this is this is Homer, our guide, the AI, who um, says their memory is failing. It's trying to reconstruct events for us. Um, and because their memory is failing, they're sort of dripping them out piecemeal. But also, they're, they're a storytelling AI, so they're kind of weaving a narrative um, at the same time. So as well as getting things like encyclopedia entries, um, we're also getting narrative um, that is kind of third person prose, um, very much as you'd expect to find in fiction. So that's an interesting element. So I think our next thing to do is to have a look at the people the people section so we'll start off in life support yeah oh yeah I was wondering there was um kind of a fanciful name that came up last time um about um in one of the in the last history section we read so I wondered if that person would ask their name was something like jet or something it was it was a bit much um uh, I wonder if they'd come up in here, but they haven't. So a store is, is who we're looking up on. So yeah, that's what I was expecting. We get the, the unisex symbol there. So a store was born on 16th of February 1997 and died on the 17th of January 2066, apparently. That does appear to be what these, these dates mean from context and other entries. 
So, I mean, so I've also made the assumption because we, we have access, once we have kind of identified and unlocked a character um, within the, the scheme of the story, we then have access to these stats about them usually. And even, um, even if they are no longer alive, there seems to be a uh, record for their, um, their bodily functions. So I assume that's probably the, the last known record that we have of them. So I don't know if, um, if any of this information is really gonna tell us anything substantive about Astora. Um, I'm going to click through it. Um, if any last last stream, um, oh the EEG went downhill, didn't it? Uh, last stream we did go through what each of these um, categories and what each of these abbreviations mean. If anybody watching um, who who isn't familiar with them uh, would like a a catch up on what they are, then please let me know in chat and I will. I will go through them for you, but I think for the sake of expediency in this uh, in this part of the playthrough, I'm just going to keep uh, keep going. And um, if I need to refer to anything, uh, I will. Um, but otherwise, I might just leave them unexplained in this in this part. Uh, okay, sure. So yeah, there does seem to be some sort of traumatic things that might happen at end of life uh, in there. But um, not necessarily uh, information that's particularly useful for for what we're doing here. The um, I guess the genealogy information might have kind of a narrative uh, implication. Okay, so hang on. So a store in Malay. Is related to the algam blouse and the gameshes. Um, we've seen algam blouse uh, in another family tree, so I wonder if that's what we're looking for. So, okay, interesting. So, um, as well as being part of the unisex movement, um, which did not meet approval from uh, Astora's daughter, who is Peter's mother. Um, uh, a story is known for having uh, a touch of extrasensory perception, um, such that it was sort of noted um, within family stories that that was the case. Um, so there's some uh, like thirty percent uh, ESP potential shown here, um, and then low levels of bodily fat, um, quite a lot of slow twitch muscles, not much in the way of fast twitch muscles, that's what those mean. And then um, pretty good capability in maths, music and linguistics, um, slightly less so in R. So that's what that's all about. So let's see if we can find who was also an Augenblau. Let's have a look at Wanda. Not Wanda. There's, so there's a person we don't really have a connection to who's Regent Sable, so I wonder if Regent Sable is who I'm looking for. No. Okay. Yeah, Regent Sable just kind of turned up in the list without much um, fanfare. No, so who was it then? Um... So it's not those two, no. Does I do? Does I just have a look at it more? I can't remember now. I was just clicking away happily talking to you, and I. Uh... No, yeah, I did have a look at that. Uh, I lost track of myself. So. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, did I just spot them in Simi's family tree? Then is that what happened? Uh, yes, I did, but it goes back two generations, so, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, so there's, there's no um, interrelated connection, a family history there that um, seems relevant. That's okay to know. And then, 
there's the psychology tab and Edmond that we can visit. So, so Malay. Let's see, how was your emotional life? Or statistical measures of your emotional life? High level of maturity, medium level of hostility, low level of self esteem. Interesting. I wonder at what point these measures are taken. Oh, interesting. So this is supposed to be personal growth, and that's, I think this is the lowest I've ever seen these bars for anybody. Um, and this is in, I can't remember what intro is. Um, I could look those up, but that's interesting. Okay, maths and music, fairly high. Science middling, art low. Oh, that's interesting because art was higher than that, I think, in the other um, set of statistics. So I'm not quite sure what that that means. There is um there is an element of the unreliable narrator in this as well, which is is intriguing. Uh, there are definitely some facts that have come up in history that haven't quite been borne out in other sections when we've we found information there such as dates of birth and and names as well um, yeah so this is uh, mathematics deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning levels for Astora uh, linguistic and music uh, yeah are uh, yeah, so art's a little bit higher here than it was in the other one. Writing, wow, okay. Uh, memory. Oh, okay. Fairly low levels across the board for attention span, short term memory, um, like speed of learning, and long term memory. Uh, Did I look at social adjustment? No, I didn't. So spatial awareness, kind of like body, bodily awareness and social awareness. They're all quite high. Well, Interesting. I don't know that that actually tells me much about about them as a person. Let's go back to central processing. That's usually usually a good point to to call in. Okay, nothing there. I never think about it, actually the um, the logo for central processing. I think it does kind of kind of call to mind. Um, the Central Services from uh, the 1985 film Brazil, um, which I guess would have been kind of made contemporaneous with this, which is interesting. Um, so Homer, have you got any new info for me? Oh yeah, are we? Oh yeah, we filled up that page entirely. I hadn't realised we'd done that. Okay. Um, I'm going to just take a quick sip of drink, and then I will read this for us. Okay, Homer, Na 2, dash, AD, uh, stroke, ref, at 5403. His grandmother had had disturbing dreams after her conversion. The family had hollow recordings of it speaking of the, of it speaking of those dreams, the old thing seated, in full flesh and colour, though the lighting was harsh from the side and generally poor, as if it were seated by a window. There was that strange cast to the skin of the face, so indeterminate and mixed, not genderless but too fully gendered. I've been unisex four years with dreams, oh, the dreams, sometimes the man over me, I underneath, as I, oh, sorry folks, this is getting a bit, uh, this might, okay, I don't know how uh, graphic this is going to get, so uh, a warning for uh, perhaps some unusual sexual content coming up, uh, remembered it, other times myself protecting as if a fighter in the African wars, I remembered from my childhood, or lusting, there were the terrible images of blood and death, and the limited nuclear accident you can still see where Gibraltar was. It was so strange, sometimes the dreams would make me both at once lover and loved. So strange. Its voice grew frail and odd then, 
as if it fell into an empty reverie, as if it had the syndrome. But it straightened in the chair, before the Vostok massacre, it said, its voice sliding, as unisex voices did, up and down the scale unpredictably. Eleven days before the Vostok massacre I dreamed, a child ran down a tunnel, holding a stick, a very precious stick. I knew the feeling of it, that it was valuable because it was wood, which made the place Antarctica, of course, where, where wood's so very scarce. The meld slats of the tunnel wore like ribs, and running with the sticks so it clicked on the slats. It was joyous, that running, and the clicking sound of the wooden stick. It paused again. The story was so old, so well worn with the telling of it. There was a trace of smile at its lips, remembering. Then the tunnel collapsed, the hum of neurophage weapons, that awful sound like nails on chalkboard, like the squeal of atmospherics crossing one another, that awful silence as the voices cut off. The child stopped running when the tunnel collapsed, stopped running, stopped in the clicking, stopped, just stopped. The winds blew down, so cold, so cold through the open ceiling of the tunnel. You see, the child froze there in the tunnel. Her hand froze to the metal wall, her precious stick in her hand. It looked into the scanners directly, its features moving from light to shadow and back as its head turned. I awoke then in fear. This dream was real, real as others I had, but more terrible. Why would I dream of a massacre like that? I knew no one in Antarctica then, knew nothing of the place, yet I knew from the dream how precious a wooden stick would be, what a treasure it was to a child, a child who would die. The frightening thing, of course, was that the men who came in through the broken walls were elite neutralisation corps troopers. They were our soldiers attacking a city in the ice. Why? I could not believe it, though I knew from the feeling of that dream that it was true. I haunted the hollows and news nets, but there was nothing. Days went by, but each night the dream returned. Bits of it. The tunnel, the winds, the clicking sound, distant voices. I saw a heat pump power plant, underground gardens and nursery. Even then, of course, people feared the ants because no one knew what they were doing, what they were up to. The satellites couldn't see them well. Ice baffled the infrareds, and the coverage was patchy. That's what the news nets told us. Then the news nets told us the ENC had investigated the ants' research centre at Vostok. That's what they called it, an investigation. Years later, we knew it was a massacre. It shook its head, and its hair, very white now, swirled like snow in and out of the light. The child froze, it said. A very disturbing dream. I told no one of this dream, or of any of the others, only this recording. But I saw the Vostok massacre eleven days before it happened. Ooh, that was... interesting. Okay. Well, okay, so that's as far as home is leading us down this path for a moment. So that kind of leads us to the military. So Homer can break us into here, hopefully. Yeah, so nothing here. Um, geography? Antarctica? I guess history is an obvious place to go, isn't it? No, nothing there. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, so there's quite a few references uh, we can pick up here. So let's have a look at the Gibraltar disaster. It sounds horrific. Historical Cultural Data Link Entry, Gibraltar Disaster, Re, Devore, Peter, via Edmod, Ref436745 at 2. Gibraltar, 23rd of August 2035, parentheses 08232035. Only incidents of full China Syndrome nuclear meltdown. Not even the Chernobyl episode of the previous century had such widespread effects. Gibraltar was completely destroyed leaving only the crater now known as the lake. Oh, okay. Sounds catastrophic. Um, Vostok Massacre. I'm afraid this isn't going to get any, any more cheery at the moment. 
folks. I um I apologize for that. Okay, so this is Vostok Massacre re Devor Peter uh via Edward, same reference. February the fourteenth, twenty thirty nine. Uh, parentheses 0214-2039 Abortive invasion of Antarctica by renegade ENC forces under General Doivin Smith Vostok warrants were destroyed with terrible loss of life but all invaders were hunted down by highly individualistic ants and destroyed I wonder what these ants are Smith's name is now synonymous with treachery Oh, one of those Okay Elite neutralization. Um, via the same um, search reference. ENC, the Elite Neutralization Corps, are the police force of the Intercorp Council. Their mandate is theoretically limited to local action in troubled areas and the use of personal neurophage weapons, parentheses, mil spec, only. This provision puts them at a severe. Oh, it says sever, but I assume it means severe disadvantage during the mind wars. QV. So, can I look up mind wars, please? No, I can't. Um, so, if I had mentioned these these neurophagic weapons and the mind wars, and an implication that that has somehow um, caused a new. Um, genus of disease, I don't know if that's, that's probably not the right usage, is it? Um, a new strand of disease um, prompted by, I think, like direct interference with uh, with mental processes, by the sounds of it. Okay, dream, ref. Number two seven eight six two one eight nine seven dash six at one two one. Silent data ref number two seven eight six two one. Till up our own, can't remember what the little hat thing's called. Eight nine seven dash six at one two one. Dream Malay Astora recurrent. A child ran down a tunnel holding a stick, a very precious stick. I knew the feeling of it, that it was valuable because it was wood, which made the place Antarctic, of course, where wood's so very scarce. The melt slats of the tunnel wore like ribs, and were running with the stick so it clicked on the slats. It was joyous, that running, and the clicking sound of the wooden stick. The tunnel collapsed, the hum of neurophage weapons, that awful sound like nails on chalkboard, like the squeal of atmospherics crossing one another, that awful silence as the voices cut off. The child stopped running when the tunnel collapsed. Stopped running, stopped the clicking, stopped. Just stopped. The winds blew down so cold, so cold, through the open ceiling of the tunnel, you see. The child froze there in the tunnel, her hand frozen to the metal wall, her precious stick in her hand. And there is no more. So, I guess there's the implication there that Homer might have pulled that out of the database, and, um created an extra fictional layer around it, and now Holmes got something to say. Okay, oh, we're back to NAR1. Interesting. Okay. Peter, s Peter sped the recording forward, past the dream, past the reminiscence of the days of that strange second Mormon migration to the LP-54. He went to the place where she talked of sex again, but as always it was so unsatisfactory, so elliptical and sly, Edmod noted his interest and deemed it healthy, since the unisex movement was gone and old prejudices were fast disappearing. But he must have been thinking of it when he accessed the genealogical database at Wasatch and was momentarily distracted, for he spoke aloud. I would have experiences known only to a few, he muttered. It would have been man, woman, woman and man. It was Tiresias, perhaps, able to truly see, to know the future. Okay. Is that a is that a classical reference I'm not familiar with? It might well be. Okay. Oh, and that got to stump me out, did it? Interesting. Well, let's just double check there's something silent that we missed.
No, that's good. Okay, um, SciTech. Let's go through and check check all the um, the categories again. Okay, nothing new there. I guess now we might have something for the military. No, that was interesting. They've been very coy about that that element when we've unlocked information in all of the others. Okay. Well, I think I'll just go back to central processing then, if that's all right. Okay, and then back to home, oh, maybe? Okay, yeah, so I guess that one, the one the entry we just got was filed in here somewhere um, after the fact of us um, Having put a wrapped a fictional context around the um, the dream record, okay, NAR two uh, dash PD uh, stroke ref at five four o four. His glass fell, and he bent to retrieve it. Responsibility for the coding error may perhaps fall on the voice recognition algorithms grown for Peter, a random mutation in the crystal tanks, so the wasatch sounded like. Wallace. The hollow hung before him, but in those days there was nothing to distinguish the Silink interface from ancient Silink. Again, the sounds are the same. His VR algo should have heard the p sound in Silink, though. Peter had no reason to suspect that he was in the wrong database, or that the system would not understand his request. Family, he said, evoked potential. Okay. Yeah, so that's I mean that's covering stuff that we've already um we've already been told about. Hang on, was there an entry there that we haven't read? There is. What's this one? Imagine if you are there to do so, a small boulder balanced atop another rock. The point of contact is very small. Yet the system is stable for thousands of years. The southwest deserts hold such structures. Wind and sand weather the stones until the undercurve of the top stone and the overcurve of the foundation wear away. Now the point of contact is very small, yet the system survives. Across and down the talus slope, imagine this, a series of other stones placed by erosion and weathering by gravity and the effects of people walking, of small mammals in the crannies going about their lives, are placed in a series of delicately balanced potentials. Now imagine a small eddy of a breeze, shearing off the upcurve of the foundation in just the right direction, and with just the right force to topple the boulder in just the right direction. A cascade begins, a series of collisions that ends in a vast shifting in the entire talus slope. The potential is evoked. This is what seems to have happened when Peter spoke the two key words to Silink. The reality quotient shifted, and everything changed. But the rock is in a desert, and there was no one to see the talus slope shift. No one but Peter. Okay. We was definitely given um, what happened some moment there, Homer, but uh, I don't feel like you're given us kind of any informational leads. If this is uh, this is kind of an investigation, um, well, let's crack through the, the categories again. See if anybody's 
anybody or anything has come up. So nothing about new diseases. Exciting. Scion equations. Yes, yeah, so if you can see on our notebook on screen, one of the first things we found out about Peter DeVore is that he was responsible for the Scion equation. So what are the Scion equations, please? Oh, okay, Homer wants to talk as well. 0503270. What's that your interpretation? Parentheses, Scilink directive. Suggests matrilineal mitochondriac analysis BP3777. 5 prime pineal secretion levels 0 0.87 0.08737E POS Inquiry direction Randax denied Homo request denied Directory hierarchy pointers lost Message follows Certain equations 1990 GAD DS so that's another character we know about Nobel Prize 2002 First suggested correlation between 11-dimensional topology and mental map space. That was uh, uh, technical. Okay, Homer. Come to Homer. I have a file ready for you. That's a little sinister, Homer. Okay. Uh... Ooh, and you're all flashy as well. Um, I'm a little worried, so I might check some of the other locations first. Um, are you going to be saying the same thing, Homer? Yeah, you are. Okay. The um, the fact that you're so insistent um, is a little, a little alarming to me. History, 2030 to 2039. Let's do it. Let's get some more context for this world, please. Twenty thirty to 2031. Geriatric Life Support Technologies Rights Act. Life expectancy reaches 114. Genetic Diversity Act. Simi DeVore, born November the 7th. 2031 to Astora Mo Molay, 2032 to 33, first tailored helpers. So I assume that doesn't mean employees um, in, in snappy suits. Uh, mental contracts disease later called genetic drift syndrome. Okay. Vega Starship construction complete. 2034 to 35, tailored helpers commonplace. A storm mol mole gets unisex conversion surgery. So this is both a global and very personal history that we're getting here. Mentor enters private hospital for treatment of syndrome. 2036-37. Full dolphin communication established. Dolphin Rights Act. That's amazing. Oh, maybe the dolphins are in charge. And we don't know because we just haven't been to sea yet. First Vegas Starship launch. Global population, 15 billion. 2038 to 39. First tailored helpers, helper rights manifesto. So that suggests some kind of artificial life, doesn't it? Silink database restricted. Okay. Bostock massacre, February the 14th, 2039. Okay. Okay, that fills in some context and also throws in a few curveballs like dolphin communication. Military, come on, military. Come on. Tell me about this uh, this horrible private military thing that's going on. Here we go. Dueling. Hmm.
dueling involved widespread use of neurophage weapons QV individual duelists must register with the appropriate facility to assure space only consenting adults may duel see also history database why, why is dueling back? if duelists are shodan black belt in the appropriate martial art they may reserve a park for the duel all other entry will be forbidden during the course of the duel this allows for hunter prey behaviours said to enhance the duel's effectiveness at aggression control. Winners of a duel were awarded one half of the loser's income during the period of incapacity. Very popular in certain areas, especially Northwest Alliance, Mediterranean, and Southeast Asian Confederation. Practice is unknown only in Antarctica. Well, it sounds like Antarctica is the place to go. They value they value trees, and they don't battle each other for income of somebody you've incapacitated? That's horrible. All right. It looks like we haven't come back to an, a better world. So let's see if we can get any more details about what neurophage weapons are exactly. Grown individually for duelists, the small flat weapon is shaped to the back of the user's hand. GSR tape runs across the palm. Weapons are thought directed and respond only to users EEG. Interesting. NP weapons require considerable skill for proper and effective use. Adequate training and practice are the only roads to such effective use. RNA injection or Edmod implanting are useless. During the Burma War, NP bombs caused considerable damage and were subsequently banned. NP weapons affect the new Neuronal myelin sheath disrupting nerve transmission. Effects are temporary, depending on the severity of the hit. They can last up to six months with a coup de gras hit and short range discharge into the frontal lobes above the left eye. See dueling. So it causes neurological damage? Again, pr pretty horrendous. I don't know why that should be acceptable or tolerated. Um. Okay, the Mind Wars. The Mind Wars began. Oh, so this is a capsule history from February 2074, I should say. The Mind Wars began, as so many did in the late 21st century, as a personal vendetta between two managerial families. Uh huh. The Genetic Diversity Act of 2030 was still in force, but ethnic groups maintained hostilities in spite of it. Perhaps the act made things worse. Certainly the world had been on a homogenization trend for several decades before the act passed the council, a trend which the act appeared to reverse. The vendetta was registered in Cyprus. It was just one of thousands of registered vendettas that winter, that winter, monitored, regulated and ref refereed by central processing. A Greek family named uh, Nyctides had challenged a Turkish family named Chikale on the grounds of failure to pay bride price. My goodness, we're, have we made no progress? This is... Okay. In truth, the Turk had manipulated the database to squeeze out the Greek head of family from a lucrative managerial channel, and the bride price failure was only the pro forma excuse. Such things were common and quite legal since minimal neurophage violence was considered a reasonable outlet, an alternative to the kind of disaster the Burma War had been. Oh, what a state we're in. This time, something was different. The Nictides family had developed a twist on the MP weapon that did more than produce temporary disorientation. It induced permanently a new form of genetic disease, a complete loss of will. Wow. A med ten named it genetic abulia disorder for a DNA-programmed loss of will. The Chikale family was quickly decimated. Unfortunately, another Turk family took a hit and declared a vendetta against the Nyctides, who retaliated in turn. Soon all Cyprus was in a state of siege, and the ENC cops were ineffective against this new weapon, which destroyed the first contingent set in, sent in. No shields were effective. The war spread rapidly to widely scattered outbreaks as families here and there 
acquired the new technology and used it to gain temporary advantage. It fled, died down several times for the next 20 years, gradually evening out over the globe to a dull melancholy pain in the social structure. Without heroic life support intervention, victims of GAD died of starvation. Even then, they often pulled the plug on themselves. Oh, I'm, folks, I'm sorry, that is so grim. So this is our this is our brave new world. Is this it? Um. Wow. Okay. Any new characters around? Jimmy Radix. That was the person. Not called Jeff. Jimmy Radix. I think it was the Radix that made it seem uh, a, little, a little over the top. Okay. Let's find out about Jimmy Radix. So Jimmy Radix is no longer with us. And did not live a particularly long time by the standards of of their society. Um, so born last year, born last year. Okay, um, Jimmy Radix, what's going on, friend? Anything I can tell from your stats? Um, you were getting warmer, uh, presumably at the end of your life. Okay. Um. Okay, all these were going up. All these tensions. Uh, okay. Endocrine, I think that is. That was creeping up. Neurotransmitters. Okay, yeah, this is kind of the the common death pattern. We've seen one uh, shoot down and one shoot up, um, and then glycogen. Okay, interesting. All sort of levels all all over the place, really. Um, okay. So why have you come to us now, Jimmy Radix? Uh, let's just check in with geography, actually. Over here. Okay, nothing new there. What's that? Uh, Jimmy Radix, please. Okay, family tree. Okay, Jimmy, uh, born of James and Susan Radix, um, from the Radix and Wilson lines. Okay, uh, quite a lot of ESP. I think that's more than Astora had, and Astora was the one who's been noted to us as um, something of a precognitive. So that's interesting. Not sure how relevant the fact there wasn't. Slow and fast twitch muscles are, um, and basic core IQ. So what, what things were you good at, Jimmy? Uh, linguistics. Um, and our music should be high, shouldn't it? If if you're called Jimmy Radix, you should have a high music score for sure. But linguistics are the best there. Art and maths, um, the lowest. So that's cool. Uh, let's double back to history before we hit the bottom row because it mentioned there might be something about dueling in there. Okay, not yet. We are seeing a very uh, curated selection of, uh, of information here. Okay, uh, Jimmy Radix, show me some more stats. Emotion. Uh, maturity and hostility, kind of half, half by there. Uh, Self-esteem approaching 50%, I'd say. Personal growth. 
Uh, yeah, kind of increased levels of those those things. I'm gonna run myself what those are actually. I'm gonna turn to the. I've got the. I've got a fiber-based version of the uh, of the manual, as the game would put it. So let's have a look here. Just see if I can find these quickly. Yeah, so personal growth is the first one. The second one is introspection, and common sense is the last one. That's right. Um, basic core IQ. So, um, oh no, you. This puts music quite high. I guess it's that's the same kind of level, but it looks higher because linguistics isn't beside it. Um, math, art, and science. Um, middling, I would say by this scale of measurement. And then Edmod. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at your last set of stats, Jimmy. Okay, um like fifty percent inductive reasoning, um low uh, low scores in maths and deductive reasoning. Basic core IQ. Linguistics and writing, very high. Um, art and music, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so yeah. Um, very competent writer by the looks of it. Wow, ability to learn was immense. Was 100%. Nothing's been 100%. Um, so that surely means you should have been quite prodigious. Um, a, a notable attention span, um, fantastic short-term memory, poor, I'd say poor long-term memory, which is interesting. Uh, spatial awareness, I think it's that's kind of the influence here, isn't it? Spatial orientation, sorry. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, um, yeah, yeah, uh, spatial reasoning as well. Um, body, um, body, bodily kinesthetic, uh, so it's remote control and things like that, and then uh, social adjustment. So these things are all quite low, really, which is intriguing. Let's go back here. So Homer, I, I, I know you've been flashing very patiently in the corner there all this time. I'm going to have a look at central processing and then I will come and see what you've got for me. Okay, alright, I'm coming, Homer. Okay, hopefully this is a good one. Okay, I can see that Homer NAR R1 entry added in. That must be the one. Interesting what the internal uh, fictional distinction between the NAR2 and 1 uh, segments are. And whether there's, you know, 3, 4. Peter was only 14, though. A fact mentor could not have known. Peter couldn't go. Not then. But three weeks after this event, Peter began making casual inquiries into the Scion equations. Since he was mathematically gifted, Edmod had no reason to restrict his access. Okay. I guess they're chapters, aren't they? Because we're getting a, um, a non-linear presentation of this story, um, especially kind of these segments which are essentially a prose summary of what's going on. Um, and uh, this is narrative two is chapter two, I guess. So we've got this new entry, which is uh, NAR2 uh, dash RS stroke ref at 5405. Someone on the council was interested though. Regent Sable came out from Geneva twice to look at Peter first hand. 
Regent Sable was a tall, spare man, then in his mid-fifties. He happened to be standing at a viewer in Springfield West, looking down. We image him looking down, and we image what he saw. The parklands in the distance covered the ever-changing warrens of the Springfields. There in the far distance was the man with the hoe. Regent signalled for amplification as Peter came into the picture. Oh, legendary man with the hoe. I don't know what that portends. Okay, we're, we're unlocking stuff all over, so we're jumping back to chapter one with this entry. Complex, complex bud typing left disturbingly ambiguous results, though. Regent Sable could have been Peter's father, yet he never approached the boy directly, never met him. He came to Springfield West to check directly. That is what he told Central. This was a common thing for humans to do, since genetics were so important and were monitored closely. This is not to mention the importance humans attached to personal relationships, to affection and love. Okay. And then this entry. Our records show what happened there in the park, though. Peter walked openly, lost in thought. Absently he noted bird songs, scents of cut hay, the rustle of nettles brushing against his legs as he moved. He took notes on his personal monitor. Notes which now are extremely suggestive, but which at the time appeared harmless enough. He was moving into an area of fundamental brain research though it seemed he was merely playing with the functions of one of the Scion equations. It was three weeks since the coding error that opened Scilink to Peter DeVore. No warnings had been posted at Central Processing, though a momentary attention file was created at Chilink node for supervisory eyes. An audit trail shows the file was flushed 32 hours after creation, 12 hours after forwarding to Geneva, and two hours after screening, Regent Sable was the system monitor. Okay, so Regent Sable, who we didn't really know much about previously, um, seems to have a vested interest in Peter. But wait, there's more. We were tracking the two of them, with most processor time devoted to the duel. Though Regent, Regent Sable was watching Peter and the man with the hoe, he'd requested only a low-level algo, so the tracking monitors were not informed of the intrusion. What? Why are you dueling? Who's dueling whom? Well, my goodness. Um... Uh, where do we go from here? History? Whoa, okay. There, uh, there's quite a lot there. Let's read this. So Dreamleaf, ref436745 at 2. History number eight. Oh, I almost had it again. The following is a verbal account of the premiere performance of Simi DeVore's Dreamleaf, a full Mozart production that set the standard for all others to follow. Dreamleaf is the most often performed of all Mozart works. So Mozarting, as we found out last time, is um, creating um, experiences uh, directly for the brain, artistic artistic experiences. It began quietly in darkness, as expected. After all, thematically, it was a, pa a, past a pastoral and should begin with dawn. The sound was not quite audible, a tremulous shiver at the edge of the human auditory range, as if aspen leaves were trembling in the slightest breath of air. 
The sensation of floating grew steadily stronger as harmonics entered, expanded and contracted. Soon it was a rhythm these harmonics made, a slow, nearly imperceptible pulse which gradually coalesced into a two-part beat, one loud, the next soft, almost as if something was surging first forward and then back. It became a heartbeat. The floating continued but began to twist in place as if turning head downward for a plunge into depths. A green so faint it was almost black emerged, developed a fine grain which grew coarser, details struggling to sharpen. The grain spread, grew fine again, and the green faded away, replaced by the deepest red, again nearly black. The gyration slowed further, moving upright as if the feet were dropping slowly towards some surface. The light grew brighter. A soft heartbeat sounds began to syncopate. Now there were two such sounds, beating like not quite in synchrony with one another. Another motion overlay the gyration, a rhythmic rise and fall, as of tides moving through kelp. At the same time, the colours too began to pulse, lighter and darker, like walking along a row of trees with the sun behind it, light to shadow to light again. It's the womb, a woman said. Birth. It was not. It was a dream of birth, a dream of the womb, a dream out of Simi's talent and experience. The colours faded again, the sound grew steadily louder, the heartbeats coming in and out of sync, the rise and fall accelerating as if the fetal audience was carried inside someone moving from a walk to a run. An unfocused yellow grew, grew drew together, shaped a sphere, began to spin. With the spinning globe, trails of yellow and orange and red curled off, left behind by the fury of that turning. The trails themselves fell into themselves, formed new spheres, made planets. Not real planets, surely, but the mere suggestion of planets, the yellow sphere making the merest hint of a sun. Something obtruded on that sun, some shadow fell between the audience and that light, and when the shadow fell, a feeling of desolation, of yearning, replaced the floating. There was a harsh melody then, dissonant and filled with despair, a melody with notes, phrases, intervals missing, loaded with subsonics. A light musical theme appeared underneath the heavy dissonance, a melodic trill, the shadow took on shape and became light green, an aspen leaf shivering against the sun. The melody gradually took over, dominated by high flute sounds and something mellow like an oboe. Tree trunks formed out of the darkness, the scene became an aspen grove on a mountainside. Strong sage scent filled the air, a cool breeze moved. Suddenly it was dark again, as it was in the beginning. The heartbeats re-emerged, stronger now, with a cooler wind blowing, then it was cold. The light grew, a grey light, a white light, harsh and demanding, heavy cloud light and harsh ice and snow light. The heartbeats became the sound of icy waters surging against the monstrous shelf of ice. Everyone would know this was Antarctica, the cruelest place on earth. A reptilian head appeared over the edge of the ice, a head with a gaping mouth filled with needle teeth. The head slid forward on an endless neck, followed at last by an enormous body spotted and fast. The light snapped out, and the sensation was of nightmare running, frozen panic. The cold cut deeper. Everything had stopped. Music, heartbeat, colour shaping, sensation, everything. Silence was on the face of the void. Out of the silence, the tension grew. Mouths opened to scream, but no sound came. There was nothing, absolute and without end. It lasted until the heartbeats made their way into awareness, with them the sudden understanding that they had been there all along. The sensation was a landmark in the void, a fulcrum around which the world could form, out of which that tremulous shiver that had begun the peace could appear, a shiver that swelled from a distant slate blue light, slowly at first, then more swiftly, until it bore down with unimaginable intensity that did not pass, but grew and grew until the light swallowed everything and was replaced by darkness. Well, that was quite an entry. Um, so, should we see what Homer um, wants with us uh, before we read any more history? Oh, come to Homer. I have a file ready for you. Okay, Homer. Um, I'm going to keep reading this. Um, uh, oops. This history, if I may. So, what is sphere play? 
might be another uh, another account of a Mozart work. Historical and cultural data link entry games. Sphere play. Read of all Peter. Okay. Sphere play. A pico electronic team sport using a statically charged sphere. Skill is required in calculating vectors and angles to keep the sphere in play as long as the charge lasts. Only the special repellent wands can touch the sphere. Contact with any number of surfaces can deplete the charge. Okay. I guess that's the kind of fun they um, they make in the future. You heard it here first. Sphere play. New poverty undergrounds. Okay, so we seem to unlock lots of things that were kind of dropped as little hints here and there. Um, so new poverty underground. New poverty movement was mentioned previously. The new poverty movement was just one among many back to simplicity movements, not all that unlike E cubed, the various LP groups, or even the Intercorp Council itself. But as the council took over more and more of the world's management functions, the new poverty movement found itself in opposition to the dictates of what it saw as mega business, centred now in Geneva, the heart of the world information economy. The Intercorp Council controlled most of the flow of information throughout the world by 2035, and as its grip grew more firm, the Council's wealth and power grew as well. The New Poverty Movement was not opposed to the Intercorp's control of information. New Poverty claimed not to be interested in power or wealth or control. New Poverty saw the flow of information as inherently evil, and the movement gathered adherence as the volume and texture of information grew more and more overwhelming. So new poverty came to mean freedom from information. Okay, not freedom of information. Its targets were frequently research establishments, information brokers or media nodes. Although it never attacked the Intercorp Council directly, New Poverty's politics were enough in conflict to put it on the prescribed list. New Poverty went underground in 2042, I understand. So unlike the... Um, like the major world cities, which physically went underground. Um, New Poverty, the movement, went figuratively underground. I see. And then I think we're going to get some... Oh, Psyche Institute, okay. We'll get to... We'll get to... Um, Dueling in a minute. Okay, it's just a short one. Um, Institute for Psychic Researchers, founded in Baja, California, by Dipmore Seminole Gad. <sighs> I think we need to write down that we know um, Dipmore's middle name now. It might be the most uh, most important thing we find out today. Okay, destroyed in 2052, later re-established on Mount Erebus in Antarctica. Ah, amazing. Is there is there a real Mount Erebus in Antarctica? Because that sounds fantastic. Um, back to here, please. Oh, okay. We're good. We're back in. Okay, this okay. This keeps adding stuff on, doesn't it? So I need to look at mentor ref four three six seven four five at two. So this is Dipmore Seminole Gad. Uh, mentor advisor to Tele Telemachus in the Odyssey, an ancient text. Oh, so the word mentor comes from a character in the Odyssey. I did not know that. Um, an ancient text by a legendary storyteller named Homer, Telemachus, looking for his father Odysseus, is aided by the older man. Later the goddess Athena appears in his form. Mentor chose his name. Gad felt he was advising a Telemachus when he contacted Peter DeVore. Interesting. Okay, now we can look at personal jewels. Okay. Dueling, with the elimination of the nuclear threat and the decline of large-scale military conflicts, a social interest in individual combat developed around various martial arts. 
Neurophage weapons made relatively safe dueling possible, and its popularity, while never high, was persistent and widespread geographically. Oh, then that, that's it. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I find that hard to believe sociologically, but what do I know, eh? Um, well, that was an awful lot of stuff, wasn't it? I feel like we probably need to go back to the other areas as well, just in case there's, um, there's stuff unlocked before we head back to Homer. Okay, so nothing in Med 10. Silink. Nothing in Silink. Okay. Yeah, but what about Silink? I mean, SciTech. Yeah, liquid nitrogen transport and Pico Electronics. So they're things we've um, we've had mentioned to us before, but they just sort of seem to have dropped in now. Um, I guess that makes it more more digestible than giving us all the world building at once. So general science and technology information: current entry: liquid nitrogen transport, liquid nitrogen vehicles. With the advent of pocket fusion, oh, what a term, pocket fusion. I mean, if that goes wrong, you're um, you're in serious trouble. Um, so pocket fusion and axion flux generation. Easy cooling provided liquid nitrogen for propulsion. Pollution-free, cheap and quiet liquid nitrogen vehicles became the transport of choice by 2033. Okay, bring it on. That's all for that one. Oh, hang on, there was... That, Im that image looked interesting, let's just check that out. Um, I haven't done much of the, uh, the looking at the uh, illustrative images. So that, is that a type of transport? What do you think? I guess it could be. I'm not sure which way up it would go. I thought maybe they'd just sort of look like cars, but have, you know, invisibly be powered by nitrogen rather than uh, anything else. Okay, Pico Electronics, which is quite a, a dainty little term. We got a corruption data failure. Yeah. Okay. Um, a transitional stage on the way to true organics in electronic micro miniaturization. Pico Electronic Systems were ultra large scale organically grown circuits of high reliability, proven against failure greater than. 99.75467%. A DNA substrate was programmed with the PICO circuit, and the circuits themselves were then allowed to generate in appropriate vats. World opinion held that the very best PICO electronics were grown in Antarctica, the result both of the ants. Oh, the ants are Antarcticans! Oh. Ants skilled with the DNA substrates and the particular chemistry of the sub ice ocean where the filament farms were located. Okay. So that's all that. Jolly good. Um, I'm not expecting anything more in military, but I guess it's worth a try, isn't it? I feel like we've probably uncovered the relevant sections. And this is more about weaponry, maybe? No. Life support. So, still not really sure who Jimmy Radix is and how they figure into everything else. Um, so, that's a curiosity. Okay, nothing there. Uh, central processing. Psyche ref three seven four five six four.
Central Processing, Ref 374564, DG, parentheses M, stroke code 6, append Ref to History. Following the attack on Psyche Baha, Dipmore Seminole Gad, aka Mentor, dropped from sight. Such an action was extremely difficult. It would still be difficult despite the erosion of our remote sensors and peripherals. Human beings were tagged, catalogued, monitored, and maintained. Satellite surveillance could pinpoint any individual to within 10 meters. Higher resolution was available for those with active personal monitors. Yet Gad disappeared for two years despite his age and need for massive longevity support. He resurfaced when Psyche was re established in Mount Erebus where, because of inadequate satellite coverage, our knowledge of his activities is sketchy. Great use of the word sketchy there. Um, wow. Okay. Coming back to home again. I'm expecting qu quite a dump of information from Homer, so I might take uh, a minute to have a break. Um, so, uh, everybody have a little chat amongst yourselves for a moment. Hello, I'm back. Uh, hope the little break was good for you. I took a minute to refresh myself. Um, hello to anybody joining us. We're playing some more of this very interesting computer novel called Portal. And we're just going to check in with Homer. If, um, if anybody is watching along and would like to say hello in chat, uh, I'd like to reiterate that you're you're very welcome to do so. It's lovely, always lovely to hear from people, um, and let me know what you think of this this really interesting game or fiction. I guess it's it's more work of literature, isn't it? In a an unconventional presentation. Um, I need to. How do I get my mouse to? Oh, that's doing an interesting thing. Oh, oh no! I don't want it to be doing that. Hold on a sec, folks. I'm having a, a, a technical, technical malfunction here. There, there. Here we go. Fabulous. Let's go to Homer. Oh my goodness! We've unlocked so much. So we've unlocked one more bit of chapter one and then lots of chapter two okay in we in we go after that night peter found something in like awe had crept into his attitude towards Simi. at the same time though he found himself pondering some aspects of the dreamleaf experience as if something some memory or insight were just below the threshold of his awareness. If he could only grasp it, he would have hold of something he wanted very badly. The scion equations were part of it, he was sure of that. Oh, okay. Interesting. I feel like there might be more to come in that part of the narrative, but um, it's not ours yet. So jump into chapter two. Regent Sable landed his team of commandos on the beach at El Requison at 3 a.m. Psyche was slightly defended since it possessed only minimal NP shielding. Sable used lightweight implosion pellets on the ducting system and by evening had destroyed the power plant and all the solar cells. When his team finally entered the facility, it was empty. Gad and his staff were gone. Three months later, Regent Sable offered his services to the Intercorp Council, and eight years later, moved to Geneva. Okay. So this Regent Sable's looking like a shady character, uh, really. Um, okay. So more, chapter two. As spring came, the first shoots showed in the dark, still cold soil of the garden. Peter brought Jimmy a present, Jimmy Radix. It was a small thing, 
a chip he'd grown himself, hacking in the synthesizer at Rand's office. Such play in off hours was permitted, though not encouraged. It's a project I have, Peter told Jimmy. This is a little spin-off. Slide in the ROM slot on your monitor. Here like this. What'll it do? Jimmy asked. He watched curiously as Peter expertly opened the slot and slid the chip inside. It's a, well, a sort of memory enhancer. It won't cure you, of course, but it can provide a kind of external refresh to your short-term memory as long as you wear the monitor. It'll take a couple of days for the chip to fuse, then you should start noticing the effects. It's a present. He smiled brightly. Well, thanks, Peter. He looked around. Got something for you, too. He led the way to his temporary greenhouse. Inside, he picked an armful of fresh winter beans, nearly a foot long. Here, he said. It's fresh food. It's very good for you. It is, Peter said doubtfully, looking at the unprocessed vegetable in his hands. Try one, Jimmy said. Like this? Sure, here I'll show you. Jimmy picked one and bit off the end. He grinned through the crunching sound of his chewing. It's good. Peter tried it. Jimmy was right. The beans were very good, sweet and crisp. Thanks, Jimmy, he said. Thanks a lot. Oh, forget it, Jimmy said. They both laughed. Okay, well that was a touching scene. So childhood friend of Peter DeVore. That's who Jimmy Radix is. Okay, this is a bit of a time jump. Hey, churl! Rover shouted. Buy this! He threw the polished sphere to Peter, who slapped it with the side of his hand, giving it a terrific backspin. The ball automatically corrected, then curved away and up. Shem dove for it, sliding along the Meldstadt floor with a grunt, but the sphere curved past him. A buzzer sounded. Good shot, Rover shouted. His voice echoed in the cavernous arena. Two or three girls lounging in the observation area clapped their hands. Get the next one. Get the next one, he told Peter, who trotted back to his lion, where he crouched, hands on knees. Start, Peter, sh Peter shouted and the sphere swung, humming, from its perch towards the primaries. Peter and Rover calculated the vectors in their heads and moved into position, but Shem threw the secondary sphere and imparted a new vector. Peter jumped hard, but missed. Joel! Rover called. Sold down one! Prithee cease! Peter grinned back. Twas a good play by Shem! He and Rover traded places, and one of Shem's teammates moved back a step. When Peter ch glanced up again, the girls were gone. Relieved, he found that his playing improved. Some time later, when the sphere's programming had reached saturation, and they had to pause to clear it, Peter noticed a man watching him from the back of the observation area. Part 1, he told he told Rover, and walked toward the man, wiping his face with a towel. Before he could get too close, the man turned abruptly and vanished through the exit. What was that? Rover asked him when he came back. I don't know, Peter replied. There was a guy back there. I thought he was watching me. So? So we had the look of an ENC cop. I'm not eager to get in trouble. Why, you do something? Not well, that I know of, Peter answered. But he was frowning. Mm. So that was the uh, sphere, sphere ball, or whatever it was called, sphere play, um, that we read about. Sphere ball. It should definitely be a game called sphere ball. Rand DeVore was a crystallography tech with North American Intercorp which gave him access to a number of restricted labs. He was standing outside the node housing at Decatur, 
watching the sun slide behind the windbreak. A heavy-set man got out of a liquid nitrogen vehicle and approached. He squinted against the sunlight, barred across the open fields by the tree trunks of the windbreak. He stood beside Ran, his eyes half closed. Neither spoke. When the sun had vanished, Ran took the man's elbow. I need to get in, Mel, he said quietly. Mel looked at him curiously. You're worried about your kid? Ran nodded. It's been a disturbing trend in some of his psych parameters. Not enough for his Edmod to get excited, but computers still haven't got the subtlety. He's spending too much time either by himself or out in the park with a man named Jimmy Radix, an HMDS victim. Okay. So, yeah, so Jimmy's an adult at the time that uh, Peter's a child. What's he do there? Mel asked. Gardening. I can see. I can see why you'd be worried. That's no job for a human. He frowned. Oh, Jimmy's the man with the hoe. Of course, Jimmy's the man with the hoe. Ah, oh, it's all it's all falling into place now. He frowned. He frowned. So you want to monitor his Edmar algos directly? Ran didn't answer. Mel sighed and spoke to the security system. Sex Sis answered. ID complete. Access provisional. 15 minutes. The door opened. They emerged a quarter of an hour later into the night. Well? Mel asked. Strange, there are gaps, almost as if the crystals had grown imperfections. Little things. The subroutine that should log his query to WhatsApp skipped. Edmond doesn't record of that doesn't record of entry. These things happen, Mel said. Trillions of gigabytes, there's a small error factor. The protocol should catch enough to reconstruct at least. It's as if a small segment of memory had been dumped. It doesn't make sense. I've seen crystals pass with particle flaws, Mel said. You can't handle gigabits with absolute reliability. Sometimes it happens. Replace this crystal. Suppose you're right, Rand said. He looked up at the sky. The stars looked back. The world was very peaceful, very stable. Okay, crystal, crystal floors. Um, and then, oh, okay, still two more to go. It hasn't backfilled anything. Okay. He went topside, to the temporary gazebo his father maintained. When Peter arrived, Simi was asleep in a hammock strung between ancient elms, whose leaves this late in the season were already an almost brownish yellow. It was Indian summer, clear and warm and dry. He watched her sleep, then sat on the lowest step of the porch. You wanted me? Simi interrupted his thoughts a few minutes later. She watched him through lowered lids, still half asleep. Hmm. He pulled a dry grass stalk and chewed on it thoughtfully for a moment. You know that hollow of Grandmother Astora? Yes. She had a dream about the Vostok massacre. Yes. Could have been a coincidence, couldn't it? I mean, prequel dreams aren't reliable at all, since it's impossible to in interpret them in advance. Could have been coincidence, yes, the, the details. Oh, sure. Peter waved his stalk in the air. The tunnel was breached, children froze, there was a massacre. Still, no one knows if there was one child who froze to death with a wooden stick in her hand. True. See me, we're sitting up now. Go on. Well, the question is, what material could have been authentic prophecy, and what was material from a story's own unconscious mind? Simi smiled. Is that really the question? Peter looked startled. No, you're right, that isn't the question. There's something in Dreamleaf, something about the way you Mozart with the probes and all that programming. Something about the interaction between your mind and the AI machinery, combined with lucid dream shaping. Well, I got the idea maybe we could, well, 
control things. Control things how? Simi was uneasy. She got out of the hammock and walked over to the elm, putting her palm against the rough bark. I'm not sure, he frowned. There are a lot of ancient dreams about psi effects, but at best we develop techniques for enhanced intuition, no real power. You sound like you've been into the Wallace Siren database. No. He spoke a little too loud and lowered his voice. No, there were stories, old discs, writers like Lovecraft and Heinlein, for instance, who had fantasies about such powers. I know that hundreds of years of Silink psychic research are available in Silink, but I can't get in. Edmond won't let me. All right, Peter. Her hand reached toward him. Your Edmond knows your personality indices. You've been raised for a math and technical niche. You'd only be distracted into a dead end by exploring Wallace. He snorted. Edmond's machine. Yes, but grown for you, Peter. Adapted as closely to your DNA as a personal NP is adapted to its user's EEG. In that sense, it's more than a machine. You don't believe that any more than I do. Simi was taken aback. How can you say that? Because you're an artist. You shape what the machines do, not the other way around. She laughed uneasily. <laughs> okay, true enough. What you propose then is that not only is psychic functioning real, which we already know, but that it can also be reliable? He nodded. And powerful. We have to remake ourselves, not just superficial stuff like head ornamentation or gender. Wow. Uh, Simi winced at this reference to her mother, but said nothing. Suddenly, Peter leaned toward her and lowered his voice. Look, he said earnestly. There are these areas of human experience, you see, dreams and trance states and what happens in the biofeedback chambers. Already we can control digestion, blood pressure, skin temperature, all that stuff. Even a techie like me can do it. How does it happen? Peter, everyone knows it's based on quantum effects. We can do that to ourselves because we understand the mind-body interaction pretty well, but the energy expenditure is minimal, yet such things still require enormous attention and focus. To do what you're suggesting will require enormous energy output. He threw his grass stalk away. You don't really know what I'm suggesting, he said. Well then, what? She was interrupted by a musical tone, followed by the voice of Peter's Edmod. Peter, return. Please return for social training and analysis. Peter pulled a wry face. You know what that means. That means I've got to meet with my peer group and interact. He laughed. Actually, it's kind of fun. We tell jokes. You tell jokes, she said, watching him go. All around her, the Indian summer seemed suspended in time. Okay, there was a lot in there. Um, yeah, it feels like we're at, ooh, at, at more of a gallop through the, um, the story. So we've got one new chapter two bit and one previous chapter one bit to fill in. I'm wondering as we go through this if there are sort of certain keywords that flag up these entries to appear, um, and they might appear in like the keywords might appear in more than one place. Okay, let's see what context this drops us into. He began to take precautions. He encrypted almost everything he did outside of regular training, since he did it under the guise of his own transform cryptography math. No particular flag was put on his memos. He began to make more frequent trips topside to visit with Jimmy Radix. It was a strange relationship, even for those times. Jimmy Radix was over 50, yet thought he was only 23. A look in the mirror would upset him greatly, seeing as he would the deep lines around his nose and mouth, the grey hair at his temples, the faded look to his skin. He had received no longevity treatments because of his condition, nor would he. The, uh, they aggravated the HMD syndrome. Peter was 15 then, with certain aspects of his personality and intelligence indices overdeveloped. Yet Peter, with very high quotients in many areas, seemed to have an almost hero-worshipping attitude toward Jimmy, who suffered from HMDS, and who was only comfortable when performing repetitive tasks.
Okay, well that lays out some of the uh, the Jimmy uh, the Jimmy and Peter relationship, and then let's see what this entry is. The duelists were registered out of Cairo Warren, so Springfield Park was reserved. Neither the man with the hoe nor Peter should have been there. Again, something was not right. Procedures had altered. It was 1543H, July 22, an ordinary summer day, but for the presence of these two humans where they should not be. The duelist, a 42-year-old female challenged by her 37-year-old former lover, were both black belts in at least two martial arts and accomplished with MP weapons. I think I know where this is going, unfortunately. They had entered Springfield from opposite corners with no expectation of finding other humans present. While dueling was common, most duels took place in special warren chambers. It was rare to find a pair reserving a park. But these were showdown, black belt holders, and their animosity was great, so central processing gave them the park. The female moved through the undergrowth, her dark ninja hood pulled up. She'd had keratin manipulation and wore a crest of scarlet of feathers of scarlet of feathers instead of hair. The male had been attracted to her display and the subtle control she had over the crest. Such displays were meant to attract in such a sexually competitive society. Now, though, she did not want to be seen. She moved into a grove of beech trees as the shadow of a cumulus cloud flew across the ground. The movement of shadow covered her own into the grove, but the male, approaching from the south, saw and moved swiftly to keep her in view. Meanwhile, the man with the hoe continued his gardening off to the male's right, uninterrupted and unaware. The air grew chill under the cloud, an abrupt and uncomfortable shift, and the female shivered enough to disturb the leaves. The male dropped to one knee, sighted along the rangefinder of his personal MP, and expressed the thought necessary to send an MP pulse. She was shielded by the thick trunk, and warned by the distinctive humming subsonic buzz of MP, she melted back into the grove, maintaining a complex of tree trunks between herself and the male, yet luring him into the grove by offering small targets. Once deep inside, she lowered her hood and raised her crest, a sign of both attraction and danger. The male apparently thought he had made a hit, for he moved with both carelessness and confidence. He hadn't abandoned all caution, of course, since to do so would be very foolish. And he was not a fool. A glancing shot would have meant rapid recovery, and he had to be sure. The wind picked up and the humidity dropped. Peter had heard the NP buzz, and had certainly seen enough jewels on Hollow, and been trained adequately by his Edward in survival. He had the best available programming, so he moved more cautiously, personal monitor records show he felt both fear and curiosity. He moved on towards the gardener as the female showed her crest. The male, poised at the edge of the grove and about to enter, stopped in surprise. She fired then, but too hastily, and her pulse clipped a white-tailed deer grazing on the first shoots from the gardener's beet row. The deer leaped once, walked for a moment in a dazed circle, then slowly collapsed first onto its forelegs, then onto its side. Ruminants have poor tolerance for NP weapons. Peter shouted as he began to run toward him. The male, thinking he was his opponent, turned and focused on Peter, presenting as he did so a broad target for the female. Their weapons discharged together, but of course Peter was in the open, and the eyes on the Springfield Tower could see him clearly, so Regent Sable saw him fall. The female emerged from the grove and stood over the male, seated on the grass with a blank expression. 
Hello, he said. Hello, she said. Slime. She pointed her NP and discharged it directly into his frontals just above the left eye. This was the coup de grace, and Springfield Centre immediately awarded her the win, plus half his income until he recovered, a period of time under such circumstances likely to be quite lengthy. Her feathers flared in victory. Peter got up slowly and shook his head. The male's hit had clipped his ankle, knocking it out from under him and disorienting him briefly. The man with the hoe never looked up, even when the female walked by on her way to NW entry. He continued his rhythmic movements forward and back, forward and back, the hoe biting into the dark earth, down one row and up another, while Peter stood watching without moving. Okay, that didn't go where I thought it was going to go. Um, again, I don't know what that would lead on to. Fascinating. Well, I guess um, we'll take one more lap of all the categories and see if there's anything else to, to sweep up. I'll have another little sip of water while we do that. Okay, um, do you find this um, this way of constructing or reconstructing a story quite fascinating? Um, I'm definitely in, invested in, uh, in working out what's going on here. I um, was kind of wondering because some of the characters do appear to, to still be alive. I was wondering how the, uh, the game would frame us not being able to, to get in touch with them, as we're supposed to be um, a lone human being uh, in the world, uh, seeking other people. But I guess if people are on some like the satellite stations, we don't, they aren't really connected. Uh, there aren't really any other terminals connected to this one. Um, the game has established already. I guess by focusing on the past, um, that's kind of the present is not really where our attention is at the moment, which um, I think that works narratively. Okay, let's read about this Burma War. Uh, not called Myanmar in this reality. Okay, War Burma. Read of War, Peter, by Edmod, ref 436745 at 2. March 2051. The development of mass neophage weapons in the late 2040s, after the legalisation of personal weapons in 2048, resulted in the Burma War. Members of the Kachun organised a full-scale rebellion based on the then-legal use of such weapons. The effectiveness of ENC troops sent to put down the disturbance was destroyed, in part by the entry of other ethnic SIGs into the conflict. The war confined to the jungles and mountain regions raged for several months. First effects of their use in the form of permanent genetic diseases led directly to the prescription of mass NP weapons December the 14th, 2051. Okay, that sounds um, horrific. More data crystal failure. Alright, so we've got a little more context there and that's... That's all of that. So, military. Okay, I'm just going to write down uh, Jimmy's stats because Jimmy's clearly going to be a, an important part of this um, this narrative now, which is interesting. 
Let's just pop you, pop you in the notes here, Jimmy. I mean, we haven't really come back to um, uh, Wanda, who um, was kind of hinted would be an important character as well. Um, I feel like we're still only scratching the surface of this, which is intriguing. So I wasn't really sure um, what kind of length of game this would be. Obviously, if you were going, you could. If you're just reading this um, by yourself, you could uh, you could go a bit quicker, maybe. Um, I don't think there's any requirement to um, to check all the different stats as you go to flag those up. Um, I don't think that's um, that's a necessary thing to flag up the next uh, next things that happen. Oh, that was not okay. Just having a little little mouse confusion here, but I think we're good. I think we're back. Okay, Jimmy Radix is on our radar. Um, let's check geography and central processing for any little bits and pieces. Mount Erebus, maybe. Oh, uh oh. Okay, view hasn't held up. Uh, yes, central processing then, I guess. No? Oh. Homer. Oh, okay. We have a new... a new thing. Interesting. Jimmy finally bumped into Peter. Hello, he said. Do I know you? There was no answer. Peter looked around the garden. Finally, he said, You're the man with the hoe. I've watched you often. Often? Yes, you work in this garden all the time. Time? Peter took a deep breath. Yes, all the time. Don't you understand? Time. All the time. I hoe, I weed, the plants get bigger. I know that. I've got beets and carrots and corn over there. He pointed proudly at the stalks a hundred metres away. Peter began to suspect, but he went on. I'm Peter DeVore. What's your name? Jimmy Radix, the man answered with a pleased smile. I'm Jimmy Radix. Behind them, the jewels loser groaned. Oh, this was where they met. Excuse me, Peter said. He went over to the man, still seated cross-legged, looking at a blade of grass, making a small keening sound deep in his throat. Peter touched him on the shoulder. The male looked up. Hello, he said. Hello, hello. Peter lifted the man's wrist and pressed the panic button on his monitor. It began to pulse green. Rescue was on the way. Gently, Peter detached the man's MP weapon and examined it. Never use one of these, he said to the man, who paid no attention. The MP weapon was a small, flat, black case moulded to the back of the hand, with a band across the palm for the GSR contacts. A short extension parallels the direction of the index finger. Aiming is as easy as pointing. It was grown for this man and would be useless for Peter, but its design showed Peter. The man was Shodan. He dropped the weapon and went back to Jimmy, now hoeing again, his blade lifting and falling, biting the earth, turning it, lifting again. The rhythm was smooth and endless. Hello, Peter said. Jimmy Radix turned. Hello, he said. Do I know you? Peter nodded. I'm Peter. You're in the war. Jimmy looked puzzled. I was in the war. I got back last month. Is it over? He looked hopeful. Yes, Peter said softly. The war is over. He paused. The war has been over for a long time, Jimmy. It was over before I was born. Jimmy looked very distressed. Just a moment, 
he said. He pressed the recall button on his monitor, and words flowed on the small screen. At the same time, a small discharge of enzymes penetrated his skin. It's all right, I was in Burma, you see. MP bombs went off everywhere. The shielding collapsed on my left. The men were crying all around me. Then I was crying. I'd forgotten. I sat there in the dirt beside a huge fallen tree, crying. I'm sorry, Peter said. I'm sorry. The monitor says I got HMDS in 2054. It says I lost my... He looked at the small screen again. My short-term memory. You look familiar. We met, Peter said, a little while ago. Oh, Jimmy said. Do you like gardening? I've never done any. It looks soothing. Here, Jimmy handed him the hoe. Hold it like this. Now raise it, lower it, bring it towards you. That's it. The clouds drifted overhead, spreading shade and light at regular intervals. The smells of the new-turned earth rose under Peter's hoe. Soon he had blisters and had to stop. He was breathing heavily when he handed the tool back to Jimmy, but he was smiling too. That evening he paused frequently to stare at his blisters. He was thinking hard. From time to time he created small encrypted memos to himself. Oddly, we cannot understand them even now, but it appears he was working with the Scion equations. Somehow his connection with Wallace Silink had started a train of thought. Okay. Right, so that fills in the start of their relationship, and also things that had things that are feeding into um, Peter's understanding of of what he's doing, which is you know probably more complete than the my understanding of what he has done. It's amazing what you did, Jimmy said. No, nah, it's nothing really. It was obvious. Peter walked slowly, pausing from time to time to feel the silver-green leaves of broccoli plants, already putting forth small buds. No, no, Jimmy insisted. I mean it. I feel as if there's continuity. I didn't know how much I was missing. There was no time for me, you know? I'd just stopped. Though with this thing, he shook his wrist with the monitor. I get constant reminders. It's like always trying and then suddenly remembering. It goes on and on, trying and remembering couldn't remember before. You yeah, always had that feeling I'd forgotten. Now, thanks to you, I remember. Only when you're wearing the monitor, Jimmy. Take it off and you'll forget again. That thing's not a cure, just, just a gimmick. I know that, Peter. That's why I keep gardening. People tell me it's not fit work for a human, but I like it. They reached the end of the row. Now, he said, sitting down on a rough wooden bench. Tell me again. I think I understand a little, but tell me again. Peter sat beside him and looked out over the field. Rows of broccoli, beets, carrots, beans and corn grew neatly. Beyond, the new forest stretched to the horizon. Only an occasional neopaper hut or a warren vent broke the sense of unspoiled nature. Two things, Peter said. First is what I've been working on. I have just a glimpse, kind of like how you feel when you're about to remember something. Something about the way the equations fit together with some of the other pieces. You, for instance, and your sense of time. I don't have any, Jimmy said. Oh, but you do. It's just very different from most other people's. We get distracted, sort of, by what we think it's time. Time's arrow, it used to be called. As if time went one way at a steady pace. I don't think it's like that, Jimmy. It isn't like that in physics. And I don't think it's like that for us. You don't get distracted by time because you've lost short-term memory. So time is different for you. You can take time to look at things, and I'm going to ask you to do just that someday. Anything you want, Peter. Okay. The second thing is that I've done something just last night. What? That's the problem. I don't know. I told you about Dreamleaf. I remember. Jimmy got a faraway look in his eye. It must have been beautiful. It was beautiful, Jimmy, and scary, and very confusing, and serene, and a lot of other things. All those things seemed to happen all at once, yet not all at once. It was like what I was saying before, about time. But it made me think that we could do something with time, you see. No, you mean time travel? No, not time travel. More like collapsing time as if it were an accordion. It would make space kind of flat. I contacted someone, up here. 
Peter tapped his temple. I was asleep, Jimmy. Time does funny things in dreams, too. I started dreaming. I had control, of course. It was lucid dreaming. I was riding a huge white horse. I've never seen a horse, but in the old optical discs they carried people. I was wearing armour, like in the Middle Ages. Not heavy armour, just a protective shirt. I was riding toward a castle. He shifted on the seat, looking toward the forest. Over there, he said. I was riding over there, toward a castle. I put the castle there, of course. I always liked those old stories. There was a lady in the castle, a prisoner. She didn't know where she was. It was dark and she couldn't feel anything. I heard her voice. She was singing a sad song, Jimmy, so sad. I said hello. I wasn't riding the horse anymore. I was standing beside a window, a small opening in a stone wall. I couldn't see anything inside. It was so dark, when I, but I could hear her singing. She stopped when I said hello. She answered, Jimmy. She, uh, she said, where are you? Springfield West, I answered, I think. Oh, she said, I'm so cold. Can you? She stopped and I couldn't get her back. That's never happened in lucid dreaming, Jimmy. That's what makes lucid dreaming lucid. You can control where it goes. I had no control. It was as if I'd contacted someone, a woman, and then lost the contact. I'm going to try again tonight. Who is she? Jimmy asked softly. Peter looked at him. She's the weaving girl. He shook his head. I don't know who she is really, but she's very far away. Very far. You're going to do something grand, Peter, Jimmy said. Wow. Well, that is our wonder, I think. Based on a previous, um, a previous thing. Okay, well, let, so we've unlocked a previous entry, so let's read that, and I think we'll, we'll end the stream there for today. We've had a session. Central Processing Interface, the General Human Communications Algorithm, the Quasi-AI Node Monitors, and Homer. Information is either lacking or uncorrelated. Consensus decision is to prepare mobile probes to act as semi-autonomous agents in the warrens of Springfield, the ruins of Baja, and in the empty corridors of AA. This last especially has been troublesome, because we had such inadequate surveillance there even when WorldNet was running at optimum. Now there is no data at all, yet Antarctica is where Peter went, where Mentor was waiting. It is where the migration began. 01062106 The agent probes are away. We track them easily. Enough satellites remain, and some of the eyes on the LP5s, the lunar bases and scattered ground nodes, but we won't really know anything until they arrive. Okay, so that was like a status update, and they're trying to, the system is trying to gather more data for us by the sounds of it. How intriguing. I do wonder what will happen next. Oh, but you know what I'm going to remember to do, is I'm most certainly going to remember to save. So let's dip into central processing here. Okay, so we know there's new things to um, to look at in central processing, but we'll save those for next time. And I'll get this saving, which uh, takes a minute or two. Okay, well that's doing that. Let me see if I can uh, click away, click away. Yes, exactly clicked away. Fantastic. Um, let's just check in with chat. How are you all doing? Thank you for joining me. Much appreciated. I hope um, I hope you've enjoyed the stream. Um, this is a really intriguing story. I I like how it's um, unfolding, um, and I will definitely come back to stream some more of it. I don't. Mm, I guess my tentative plan would be for um, next Thursday, so a week today, um, seven thirty p.m. British summer time again. Um, but I don't know for certain if I'll be able to make that. So tentative plan, but. Um, if not, then then I'll be I'll be back streaming this again soon. Um, and in the meantime, if you'd like to get notifications of of when I am streaming, you can um, follow on Twitch. Um, you can um, there's probably yeah I'm pretty sure there's a link to my my Patreon in uh, my Twitch bio. 
um, you can have a look there because I, I post everything publicly and I post um, notifications of upcoming streams there as well. So that's a good place to check. And if you enjoyed this stream, there are um, VODs of many other similar things and Let's Plays on my YouTube channel. So uh, there's a link from Twitch to there. Um, it's Cat Sequences on YouTube as well. So uh, we're, nice, we're nice and saved, so I'm, I'm good to go, I think. I'll just say uh, thank you. Hello, hello, goodbye, and thank you to the people who are in chat. So that's uh, OAX2, uh, Oniva, another TV viewer, Elysian, uh, Soy Club Irville. There you go. Hello. Thank you for joining me. Uh, humans and bots alike, you're all welcome. And uh, yeah, see you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.